we are given a function that represents the amount of grass clippings that are remaining in the bin. So we put them in the bin, then they decompose, and as they decompose, they go away because that's what decomposition is. Um, so first thing we want to do is find the average rate of change of A on the interval from 0 to 30. So the average rate of change is just a slope. So we're looking for the slope between 0 and 30, so we need to find a of 30 minus a of 0 over 30 minus 0. And um, yeah, you can plug 30 into your calculator for this and 0 into your calculator, which is 6.687, and divide it by 30. And the answer comes out to be negative 0.197. And it says indicate units of measure. So this is pounds divided by days, pounds per day. And they gave two, no, they gave one point for that, one for the correct answer with the units. Good or no? Any questions or issues there? All right. Um, part B, find the value of A prime of 15. So we're going to and use correct units and interpret the meaning. So A prime of 15, that should be really easy because you're given a calculator. So just have your calculator take the derivative of this at 15. That comes out to be negative 0.164. And it says using correct units, interpret the meaning of this. So this is the derivative of A, where A is um, a pounds of grass clipping. So if we take the derivative of it, that should be with respect to t pounds per day. So this is the, and we'll say that the, yeah, let's write it this way. Let's say that the pounds of grass clippings are decreasing at a rate of. 0.164 pounds per day. At t equals 15. And that was worth, I bet that was worth two points. Yeah, two points. One for the number and one for the explanation. Any questions there on B? All right, part C, we want to find the time when the amount of grass clippings in the bin is equal to the average amount of grass clippings in the bin. So first thing we need to do is find the average amount of grass clippings in the bin. So the average of any function that's continuous is 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of that function. So we need to take the average amount of this value and set it equal to the amount. So this just comes out to be some numerical value when you evaluate it on your calculator. So you graph this, the original function, minus this number and look for x-intercepts of it. And that occurs at t equals 12.415. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions on that? Um, let's see, that was worth two points. One for setting this up and one for the answer. All right, and finally, part D <clears throat> tells us that for T greater than 30, the linear approximation to A at 30 is a better model for the amount than the original function that we had. So we want to use that linearization, L of T, to figure out when there'll be half a pound of grass clippings remaining. So, <laughs> sorry about that. 
um, the linearization <laughs> ought to be equal to the value of the function itself at our center of approximation plus the derivative at our approximation or at our center of approximation times our t value that we are going to approximate at minus our center of approximation. Right, remember our linearization was f of x or sorry f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. So center of approximation, center of approximation, center of approximation, and then our independent variable. And so a of 30, you would have needed that value to be negative 0.055976. And a prime of 30 would have come out to be, no, sorry, that's that's a prime of 30. Oh, that eraser is a little bigger than it used to be. All right, and a of 30 was 0.78298. And you needed to set this thing equal to 0.5, because we want to know when there are 0.5 five pounds of grass clippings in there. So you plug in A prime, you plug in A of 30, and you would solve this equation. Subtract a half and look for x-intercepts or graph both sides and look for their intersection points. Either way you want to do it is good. Came out to be t equals 35.054. And that one was actually worth four points, two points, for the linearization, one point for setting the linearization equal to a half, and one point for correctly using your graphing calculator to solve it. Good or not? Any questions on that one? All right, let's look at the next one. Y'all are still there, right? I haven't just like frozen and I'm talking to nobody. Yes, we're here. All right, just making sure. Sometimes y'all don't say anything. And so I'm just like, I don't know what's going on. All right, um, so part A, well, it's the first off, we're given a chart of all these different values and what the values of these things are on different intervals and all this fun chunk. Um, for two different functions, f and g, and for their derivatives, f prime and g prime, we know that f and g are both twice differentiable, which means that f and g are both continuous, and f prime and g prime are both continuous and differentiable. So f and g and f prime and g prime are both continuous and differentiable functions. So first thing we want to do is find the x-coordinate of each relative minimum of f on the interval negative 2 to 3. So in order to have a relative minimum, we need to have um, a critical value. So we have critical values here and here. Um, and we also, you know, since it's a closed interval, we'd also want to look at what's going on at the endpoints. So we'll look at what's going on at the endpoints in just a second. Um, but in order for us to have an actual minimum value, our derivative needs to go from negative to positive at the critical value. Well, at this critical value, our derivative went from negative to negative. So the function itself went from decreasing to still decreasing. But then our at this critical value, our derivative went from negative to positive, which means our function went from decreasing to increasing. And so we can see that the only local minimum from the critical values should be at x equals 1. But we'd also want to look at the endpoints since it gave us a closed interval here. But if we think about the endpoints, we are um, increasing here. So this endpoint of 3 or at x equals 3 is going to be a max. And here we're decreasing. So to the left, it's going up. And so this will also be a local maximum at this endpoint of negative two. So the only answer is x equals one, and that's worth one point. Any questions there on that one? Wait, could you go over again why um, x equals negative two is not a local minimum? 
Yes, because the function um, goes from decreasing to decreasing to increasing. So our function looks like this effectively. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's curved or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But our function goes from decreasing to increasing, right? And so this is our endpoint of negative two. This is our endpoint of three. And neither of them should be a local minimum because we're ending at you know, these values that are above the values to the right or to the left of them. Does that make sense or no? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Uh -huh. Um, so if it says relative min minimum, um, you have to also consider that endpoints, um, like it's a local minimum or relative minimum if if it's decreasing all the way um, to that point, or it's um, if it was on the left side, then it would be um, increasing to the right of that point. Correct. That but only, yes, but only if they give you a closed interval. If they give you an open interval, then there are no endpoints to it. So you definitely do not include the endpoints. So just make sure you look at how they've written their interval. But yeah, Very everything cool. you said is correct. Cool. All right. Part B, explain why there must be a value for C between negative one and one, such that F double prime of C equals zero. So if f double prime of c has to equal something, right? the only way we could guarantee that this must be true is, well, there's three different ways. One, if it specifically told us that there was a point of inflection there, we might be able to determine, uh, we, we should be able to determine that this would be f double prime is equal to zero um, because it wouldn't be undefined because we know that our functions are twice differentiable. Um, but that doesn't help us because we don't know that there's a point of inflection here. It doesn't say anything about that and nothing up here would possibly indicate points of inflection. Um, second way we might know is if we were given values of f double prime, we could use the intermediate value theorem um, to say, okay, you know, suppose we went from a negative to a positive of f double prime, then we'd know that the intermediate value theorem would guarantee that we went through zero but we're not given f values of f double prime. So now we want to know still why this must equal zero somewhere on negative one to one, but um, no values of f double prime with only values of f prime. So the reasoning then has to come from the mean value theorem. So we know that f prime is continuous and differentiable, which is the beginning part of the mean value theorem. And if we look at f prime of one minus f prime of negative one over one minus negative one. Well, f prime of one is zero and f prime of negative one is also zero. This is also like Rolle's theorem, right? Uh, Rolle's theorem is just a specific application of the mean value theorem. But we end up with the average rate of change of f prime is zero on that interval. And since f prime is continuous and differentiable, then there must be a place where f double prime of c equals zero on that interval negative one to one by the mean value theorem. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, it does. Cool. That was worth two points, one for showing that it equals zero and one for an explanation using the mean value theorem. All right, part C gives us a new function h of x and we want to find h prime of three. So we've got h of x is natural log of f of x and h prime, so we'll look for h prime of x first. That'll be the derivative of natural log of a function, which should be one over that function, times the derivative of that function. So h prime of x is f prime over f, h prime of three is f prime of three over f of three, and your chart of values ought to tell you f prime of three is a half, and f of three is seven, half over seven 
how to be one to 14. Good or no? And let's see, they gave three points for that. Two points for correctly getting an expression for H prime and one point for getting your final answer there. Everyone's still good? All right. Lastly, we want the integral from negative two to three of F prime of g of x times g prime of x dx. And hopefully this one should have been pretty straightforward. With any luck, you would take a look at f prime of g times g prime and recognize that you've seen that before. What is f prime of g times g prime? Can't you do a u substitution? You can do a u substitution. We're gonna we're gonna show it that way. But I just want to this this term should look familiar. What does that term? Where have you seen that? That's right. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the derivative. We'll say things to get the chat. This is the derivative of f of g of x using the chain rule. So with any luck, you might just recognize that and say, all right, this is f of g of x from negative two to three. If we recognize it, would you still want us to like use the u substitution or would it just be okay nope. to just write f of g of x? Okay. This would be perfect, yeah. So we'd get f of g of three minus f of g of negative two. You need to find g of three and g of negative two. So that'd be one and a negative one. So f of one minus f of negative one. And f of one was two and f of negative one was eight. So you'd get negative six. And that was worth three points, two for getting the correct antiderivative and one for the answer. And if you didn't right off the bat recognize that the this was the derivative of the composition of f of g, you could just do the u substitution, and I'll write that sort of here. You could let u equal g of x, which lets us have du is g prime of x dx. And so that would give us the integral of f prime of u du. And our limits would change. You know, um, This would become g of negative 2. And this would become g of 3, which is exactly what would happen you know exactly what happens down here we end up with g of three inside of the f right it's f of whatever this value is and f of whatever this value is so you guys see how the u substitution would work yes so this would just become f of g of three minus f of g of negative two which is exactly what we had here any questions on that All right, we got one. Oh, yeah. For like part for part B of that question, um, do you have to just say NVT or can you just say Rolle's theorem because they're equal? And then um, can... if you if you specifically said Rolle's theorem, that's fine. The the scoring guide specifically says using mean value theorem, but they will know that Rolle's theorem is just a you know corollary to the mean value theorem. So you'll be good with that. That'd be fine. But you do need to state a theorem. You can't just say, oh, well, this is continuous and differentiable, so it must be zero. Yeah, you gotta make sure you state one of those two. All right, cool. Last one, then quiz time. So hopefully this one was pretty easy. Approximating C prime of 3.5 for this uh, coffee cup filling. So C prime of 3.5 ought to just be C of four minus C of three over four minus three, which should just be 12.8 minus 11.2 all over one. That was supposed to be 0.8. I don't know why I wrote a line there. Probably because I've lost my mind. And that gives us 1.6. And it says units of 
measure. So this is 1.6 ounces divided by minutes. And they were so kind as to give you one point for 1.6 and one point for the units on that. Any questions there? All right. Part B, is there a time between two and four where C prime is equal to two? Uh, once again, we could tell C prime was two if we had DME value theorem and values of C prime, but we don't. So this is going to be mean value theorem. Um, C is continuous and differentiable. We know that because it says C is a differentiable function. So we will find C of 4 minus C of 2 over 4 minus 2, which is 12.8 minus 8.8 over 2, which is 2. So, so by MBT, yes. Any questions there on part B? That was just worth two points also. One for setting up the average rate of change formula and one for using the mean value theorem in your justification properly. Okay. <clears throat> Part C wants us to use a midpoint sum, three subintervals of equal length. So we're going to use 0 to 2, 2 to 4, and 4 to 6 to approximate the value of 1 sixth of the integral from 0 to 6 of C. So we're going to use these midpoint values that they gave us, 5.3, 11.2, and 13.8, as the midpoints of each of our subintervals. We're going to multiply each of them by 2, because the length of each subinterval is 2 for our midpoint Riemann sum. So we're going to say, uh, 2 times 5, uh, I already forgot, 5.3, 11.2, and I think 13.8, yeah. Cool. So then um, we'll just divide all that by 6, and I believe, let's see, what does that come out to? That's a third of what you get when you add all those together. So that's a third of 30.3, which is 10.1. And I'm not sure if it asked for units, but if it did, those are just ounces this time. Any questions there on that one? And then we need to explain what that means. Is that what you're going to say? Um, no, I didn't really have a question, but I just wanted to check that if it was a left sum, you'd use zero, two, and four values for that. And if it was right, you'd use six, four, and two, right? If it, yeah, if it was left, you'd use the values of 0, 2, and 4. And if it was a right Riemann sum, you'd use the values of 6, 4. Everybody good so far with that? All right, and then so we're going to explain the meaning of this. And so this is just the average, since it's 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b, it's just the average amount of coffee in the cup on the interval from 0 to 6. And that one was worth three points, one for the right sum, one for the right value, and one for the right um, explanation. Good or no? All right, and part D, the last part of this one, um, they've given us an alternate model for the amount. B of T is 16 minus 16 e to the negative 0.4 T. We want to find the rate at which the amount of coffee is changing at T equals 5. So, so B of T is 16 minus 16 e to the negative 0.4 T. B prime of T ought to be the derivative of this, the derivative of 16 is 0, so that goes away. And then this one is negative 16 e to the negative 0.4 t times negative 0.4. And we're going to evaluate this at t equals 5. 
So that gives us 6.4 E to the, if we're multiplying this by 5, E to the negative 2, or 6.4 over E squared. Either of those would be good. Or this is a fraction would be fine also. Any questions on that one? All right, any other general questions before we get started with this quiz? Um, before you use like theorems like the mean value theorem, do you have to state the conditions that are satisfied before using it? Or can you, or if you don't write them, is that okay? You need to write them. Definitely need to write them. Any other questions? 